listen, I, uh, I don't normally begin a message by reading to you from a book. But today, I'd like to read a true story that happened back in 1980. Now, I know a lot of you here, it's going to be something new to you, but many of you will remember this story. It's a true story. Mount St. Helens belched gray steam plumes hundreds of feet into the blue Washington sky. Geologists watched their seismographs in growing wonder as the earth danced beneath their feet. Rangers and state police with sirens blaring herded tourists and residents from an ever-widening zone of danger. Every piece of scientific evidence predicted that the volcano would soon explode with a fury that would leave the forest flattened. Warning! blared loudspeakers on patrol cars and helicopters hovering overhead. Warning! blinked battery-powered signs at every major crossroad. Warning! pleaded radio and television announcers. Warning! echoed up and down the mountain and lakeside villages, tourist camps, and hiking trails emptied as people heard the warnings and fled for their lives. But Harry Truman refused to budge. Harry was the caretaker of a recreation lodge on Spirit Lake, five miles north of Mount St. Helens, Smoke and Shrouded Peak. The rangers warned Harry of the coming blast. Neighbors begged him to join them in their exodus. Even Harry's sister called to talk some sense into this old man's head. But Harry ignored the warnings. From the picture postcard beauty of his lakeside home, reflecting the snow-capped peak overhead, Harry grinned on national television and said, nobody knows more about this mountain than Harry and it don't dare blow up on me. On May 18th, 1980, as the boiling gases beneath the mountain surface bulged and buckled the landscape to its final limits, Harry Truman cooked his eggs and bacon fed his 16 cats the scraps, began to plant petunias around the border of his freshly mowed lawn. And at 8.31 a.m., the mountain exploded. Did Harry regret his decision in that millisecond he had before the concussive waves, traveling faster than the speed of sound, flattened him and everything else for 150 square miles? Did he have time to mourn his stubbornness as millions of tons of rock disintegrated and disappeared into a cloud reaching 10 miles into the sky? Did he struggle against the wall of mud and ash 50 feet high that buried his cabin, his cats, and his freshly mowed lawn? Or had he been vaporized when the mountain erupted with a force 500 times greater than a nuclear bomb? Now Harry is a legend in the corner of Washington where he refused to listen. He smiles down on us from posters and t-shirts and beer mugs. Balladeers sing a song about old Harry, the stubborn man who put his ear to the mountain but would not heed the warnings. Now I want to read a letter that was written 2,000 years ago concerning another major event that will soon happen. Let me read it to you. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing 
and following their own evil desires, they will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. That's a lie. Because they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. May God add his blessing today to the reading of the word. Last week we began a new series called Living Loud in the Last Days. And I believe the Lord's speaking to us through this series. I believe that he wants to get his church ready for that great glorious appearing one day when we will meet him in the air. And here's what I believe. I truly believe Jesus Christ could come at any moment for his church. And and the message of the hour is this. This is no time for the church to be sleeping. It's no time for us to be slumbering. It's no time for us to grow silent or to be fearful. But this is a time for the church to live loud in the last days. Can I get an amen today? Come on. Even though we know the signs of the times, we can look around and we can see. We know the the season of the nearness of his appearing. We know the warnings from the scripture. Peter writes a letter to the church a second time he had to remind them. And he says there's going to be a spirit in the world during those days. There's going to be the attitude of humanity about the coming of the Lord. And and he says to us, he says people will scoff at it. Critics will mock it, and skeptics will deny it, and preachers will stop preaching it, and fanatics will twist it and distort it, but he says, you can stake your life on it, church. The day of the Lord will come. Like a thief, he says. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth, think about that. The earth that we now live in and everything in it will be laid bare. But what I want you to notice is the connecting verse in verse 11. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way. In other words, in light of his coming again. In light of the judgment of God upon planet earth. 
In light of the fact that Jesus Christ could come at any moment, here's the question. What kind of people ought we to be? That's, that's the theme of this entire series. We're trying to figure out what does God demand from us as a church? What does God want us to do in these last days? How are we to live? And he tells us, you ought to live holy and godly lives. In other words, listen folks, teaching on the end times it's, it's not a time for us to pull out charts and, and, and to try to predict when Jesus is coming again. No, 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 no. Don't miss it. The teaching on the end times is to challenge us as a church and for us to evaluate ourselves and to examine our lives and to make the necessary changes that we need to make so that we can live loud in these last days. So this morning... I hope you'll take some notes. I want to give you four survival words for living loud in the last days. Very quickly. In fact, let me just say all four of them to you, and then we'll come back and dig into each one. Four survival words for living loud in the last days. Here they are. Number one is occupy. Number two is purify. Number three is watch. And number four is worship. Did you get that? Occupy, purify, watch, and worship. The first survival word for living loud in the last days is the word occupy. Now, one would think that that word would mean to take up space. But that is not the original meaning of this Word. In fact, the word occupy is the Greek word pragmatomai, and it's seen in the King James Version of the Bible, and it literally means to get busy. It means to go to work. It actually can mean to invest. And it's an interesting word because it's used only one time in the New Testament. And it is used when Jesus is telling the parable of the ten talents in Luke 19. I just want to read just the first two verses. I want to read it from the King James because I like how this reads. Jesus says, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. NIV would say ten talents. It's a form of wage. And he says to them, watch this, occupy, do business till I come again. Now, many of you already know this parable. It tells us the story about how the master calls his servants together and he tells them, I'm going away, but then I'm going to come back. And then he begins to distribute out different talents to each one. And he gives to the, to the first uh, servant, he says, I'm going to give you 10 talents when I come back. I hope that you'll invest that, occupy that, invest it, do work, uh, do business, invest it, make good of it until I come again. I want to see a return. And so the master goes away and he comes back and he says to the servant whom he gave 10 talents to, he says, what did you do with my talents? The, the servant says, I used all 10 of them, poof, and all of a sudden I gained 10 more talents. And then he goes to the one that he gave five talents to, and he says, uh, I, I, I invested my five talents, master. And he said, when I invested those five talents, I got back five more. But then he gave one talent to one of the servants, and when he returned, that servant who had one talent said to his master, he said, I thought you were a hard man to work for. I perceived you to be very harsh to work for. And so therefore, I didn't do anything with the one talent that you gave me. In fact, I, I buried it in the sand. I didn't even invest it. And the last words that the king spoke in this parable is actually the key word of the entire parable. It is the word occupy. Do business till I come again. 
Invest what I have entrusted you with. Take care of business until I come again. And I believe that's the word that the Holy Spirit is speaking in these last days to the church. Occupy until Jesus comes again. Be busy about the Father's business. Let me say it again today, church. This is no time for us to be idle. This is no time for us to twiddle our thumbs and sit in a pew. This is no time for us to switch into cruise mode or to get cold-hearted or to grow complacent. But this is a time for the church to roll up her spiritual sleeves, put on her work boots, and get busy and do the work of God and occupy until Jesus comes again. We've got to invest the talents that God has given us. You see, the Bible teaches us something in Romans 12. It teaches us, every one of us here, that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Those of us that have been born again, we're living for God. The Bible says when that happened, when you said yes to Jesus, the Bible says in Romans 12, he gave you a measure of grace. That means he gave you some type of gifting, some type of talent he has placed in your spirit, in your life. And he says to use that, put it to work, occupy Make it work for you. Make it work for my church, God is saying. You see, here's what I know. In these pews this morning, from the back of the balcony to the front of these seats, there are people all over this audience that have various different giftings. And God has placed you in the body just as he pleased. Some of you today have leadership gifts that we desperately need. Some of you have administrative gifts that we desperately need. Some of you have the gifts of hospitality, the gifts of healings, the gifts of helps, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving, and on and on the list goes. But if we're going to live loud in the last days, listen to me, if we're going to be the church in this community that God has placed us here to be, then God is asking every one of you in this house to get busy, get to work, put your talent to work, put your gifting to work, and let's go to work for the kingdom of God and grow this church and see God come down in a city. Occupy. Woo. That's the first survival word, occupy. For Jesus said, we must work while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Second survival word in these last days is this. Number two, purify. 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. I love this verse. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I want you to notice that phrase. Everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself. The word purify is a word that describes the ceremonial cleansing and preparation that a bride would make before her wedding day. And what I hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us today is this. We, the church, are the body of Christ, and we ought to be preparing ourselves and getting ready for that great day when the bride and the bridegroom will be united and we will take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now listen to me, after pastoring for over 30 years now, I know I don't look like it, but I'm old. After pastoring for over 30 years now, let me just say this, I have yet to meet a bride who is unprepared for her wedding day. If a bride wants to look her best, she's got to do the things to make preparation for her wedding day. Can I just share a a little sermonette inside of a sermon today? You're going to get something out of this. Let me give you seven ways a bride prepares herself for the wedding day. (laughs) Number one, 
She cuts ties with all other loves. Why did all the ladies, I didn't hear the guy, but she, the ladies go, amen. That's right. <laughs> she cuts ties with all other loves. Listen, by the time she gets to the altar to say I do, hey, it better be over with with any other love. Come on. Mm-hmm. True story. True story. When I was 10 years old, I, I had a little band that we traveled around. We traveled around the tri-state area and played in the parks and in the clubs, and, and we played wedding receptions. It's a true story. We were playing <laughs> We were playing a Greek wedding reception in downtown Youngstown. Yeah, have you ever been to a Greek wedding reception? Come on. Opa! Throw the dishes down. Anyway, we had just finished our first set when the, when the reception host came up to our manager and said, you better get these kids out of here. Get them out of here quick. And no sooner did she say that, we heard all kinds of commotion, and we discovered that the, the groom had taken a ketchup bottle and smacked the, the, the best man over the head with it at the Greek wedding. Because he had found out that the best man and his bride had slept together the night before the wedding. I mean, come on, man. Are you kidding me? In fact, I, th I think she said, you better get out of here because I think somebody's going to get a gun. And buddy, we packed up and we got out of there quick. Let me just stop and say, you had better end it with Bubba before, before you say I do. Come on, somebody. It better be over with. I hear the Holy Ghost say this morning, when you came to Christ, listen to me today, your relationship with sin is over. No more flirting around with the world. No more sticking your toe into the world, finding out how close you can get. Some of you want to be the bride of Christ, but you still want to hang around with Bubba. I'm telling you, it's time to cut sin off in your life and put to death the deeds of the flesh. Ooh, I can feel that resistance right there. That's the word of the Lord, friend. It's time to cut ties with sin. I'll read it to you from Scripture, James 4, 4 and 5. I like the way the Passion Translation reads here. He says, you have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair, an unholy relationship with the world. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? Oh my gosh. God is perfectly righteously jealous for our attention and for our affection. God is wholly passionate in love with his bride. And if we're going to be the bride of Christ in these last days and we're going to be ready for Jesus when he comes, we got to cut ties with all other loves. Amen. Amen. Secondly, what does a bride do before her wedding day? Number two, she sends out invitations, inviting everyone she knows to the wedding day. Why does she do that? Because she wants everyone that she knows to meet this man that she's about to marry. 
She doesn't, she doesn't care what the cost of those invitations are. She doesn't want, she, she wants to make sure all of her friends and family are invited. That's what God's asking us to do in these last days. How do we live out loud? We send out invitations. That's, that's what I love about this church. We're sending out invitations when we send more and more missionaries across the world. We're sending out invitations when we raise money to send shoe boxes out to give to children to plant churches in places that don't have them. We're sending out invitations when we spend money on marketing and local outreach and reaching this local area for the cause of Christ. We're sending out the invitations. That's why in October, I've invited our friends here for a Saturday seminar David and Vicki Elliott in October, be looking for it. They're going to teach us how to build a bridge as far as relationships go with lost people, our friends, and our family members. What are we trying to do? We're sending out invitations because we're the bride of Christ, and we want our friends, and we want our co-workers, and we want our family members to meet this man that we're about to be wedded to. Mm. How does a bride prepare herself? Number three, she's excited and she has a glow about her as she anticipates her day. Woo! There's something about all brides that are beautiful, right? I mean, they all just have a glow about them on their wedding day. I've never met an ugly bride. Well, maybe a few. No, I didn't say that. Come on, can I talk to the men for a second? Guys, do you remember what it was like before you were married? <laughs> when your bride-to-be just looked at you with, with a glow in her eyes and an anticipation in her eyes of being married to you and she just walked around and worshiped the ground that you walked on. What happened, John? <laughs> right? Ah. <laughs> Most brides I know are excited about their wedding day. They have a glow and an anticipation about marrying this man. I've got a question for you today, friend. Are you in love with Jesus like you were when you first met him? Do you still have a burning fire and passion in your heart? Do you long to just spend time with him without asking him for stuff, just to be with him, just to worship him? What about you, bride of Christ? Are you still glowing with the glory of Christ? Or are you just so darn busy that all you do is come in, punch your religious ticket on Sunday, and say, well, I went to church today. Well, good for you. Aren't you special? Come on, we need to be a church that's glowing for God and excited and passionate about being in his presence. That's what a bride does. Here's another way a bride prepares for her wedding day. Number four, she carefully considers her vows. Before she says, I do, she's counted and weighed the cost She's, she's understood, she's evaluated, she understands who she's pledging her life to. That's so why here at this church, we, we don't marry people unless we can give them some form of premarital counseling, because <laughs> we want them to count the cost and consider their vows. We want them to know what they're getting into. Jesus says, before you come after me, make sure you count the cost. Salvation is free, but it may cost you something. How many have ever experienced that? It may cost you some friends. It may cost you some family members. It, it may cost you your reputation. It, for some of us, it may cost us our very lives. The question is, have you counted the cost of following Christ? I like this next point. Here's what a bride does to prepare for her wedding day. Number five, she goes to the beauty salon. 
She goes to the beauty salon to make herself beautiful for the wedding day. Do you know this, this church has a beauty salon in it? I bet you didn't know that. We, we actually have a beautician. Let me show you where it is. It's right here. This is the beauty salon. Walking all over it right now. This is where you come to be beautified. This is where you come to the beautician, the Holy Spirit, and you kneel down and you say, Father God, remove the spots, the blemishes, the impurities from my heart. Father God, let your beauty, the beauty of the Lord be upon me. Let me glow. Lord God, remake me. Take this apart. Tear this out. Trim this. It's the altar. It's our beauty salon. I want to just say to you today, don't be ashamed to come to the altar. I want to tell you something. In this church, this altar is always open. You can come anytime you please. I, I want to tell you today, friend, there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to feel bad about getting out of your seat and coming and kneeling at an altar. The Bible says he's coming for a glorious church without spot or without wrinkle. We are the bride, and we better make regular trips to the beauty salon. Number six. She makes sure that her bags are packed and ready to go. That's what a bride does. Because she doesn't want to have to go back from the wedding reception and go back before the honeymoon and pack up her stuff. She doesn't want to have to say to the groom, wait a minute, honey, we got to wait on the honeymoon. I, I forgot to pack. I'm not ready yet. Are you ready at any moment? If Jesus came today, or would you be one of those that would say, wait a minute, Lord, I, I still got some stuff here. I, I got to go back home. I got to get in my closet. I got stuff you, I don't want you to see. She has her bags packed and ready to go. And the last thing the bride does to make preparations for the wedding day, number seven, she makes sure she has on her wedding garment. I've never known a bride that shows up on her wedding day without her dress, her wedding garment. I've never, I've never in all of my years doing a wedding, I've never stood at the front, watched a, watched a bride bust through the back doors in her short blue jeans and tank top. Never seen that at all. And I've, I've pastored some redneck towns before. Never seen that in all of my life. She always has on her beautiful wedding garment. I want you to look at a scripture with me, Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. It's that invitation. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited. See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. All you got to do is come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, here it, here's the word again, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Now, listen. It's not that they did not have value, and it's not that they were not worthy. What made them not worthy was they refused the invitation of the king. Go, therefore, 
to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? Notice the next words. And he was speechless. Can I tell you there's coming a day when God Almighty will silence the mouth of every critic, every skeptic, every doubter, every kind of religious false facade kind of thing out there, God will silence the mouth of every single person because when the king comes in, we will be speechless. And the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called. The invitation went out to everyone. But few are chosen. There's a lot of people who think that they're just going to waltz into heaven on their own terms. But I'm here to tell you today, the groom requires a wedding garment. And that wedding garment we know to be the blood-stained garment of righteousness that Jesus wraps us in when we say yes to him. That's the wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ. Without it, no one will enter the kingdom of God. The wedding day is at hand. It's time for the bride to purify herself. Are you ready? Are you ready for that great day when the bride and the groom are forever united and we join in the marriage supper of the Lamb? I have two more points, but I'm not going to work through those today. The third point is watch. Just simply means this. Be ready. Be ready, church. Watch. One translation says, watch and pray. Got to do both. Got to be on guard. We got to guard our hearts. We got to guard our minds. I remember last week talking to you about that the love of many, because of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. And I said to you, that's not going to be us. We're not going to be that church. We're always going to be loving. We're always going to reach out to the lost, those that are far away from God. But we have to be a watchful church. We have to watch, be on guard, be ready. And the last word I gave you is the word worship. Worship. That that means giving God your entire being. Your entire life belongs to him. Worship. The Bible says to, to us in Hebrews, I believe it's 13, 25, it says to us, Do not not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, but all the more gather together as you see the day approaching. That means get committed. Don't miss. Stay in the house of God. Get rooted in the house of God. Don't let the enemy try to tear you out. Let your roots go down deep. Worship. Giving God your all. See, God could care less about your song if he doesn't have your heart. Worship. Occupy, purify, watch, and worship. Old Harry Truman thought he knew everything there was to know about Mount St. Helens. And he allowed himself to grow complacent 
toward the constant warnings and signs that were around him. It wasn't the eruption of Mount St. Helens that destroyed Harry. You know what it was? It was pride. Pride is what kept Harry complacent in his cabin. Pride is what caused him to ignore the warnings. Pride is what made him look around and see the signs and hear the warnings, but totally ignore them. Pride. Listen to me, friend. One more time. I want you to heed the warning. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Would you bow your heads all over the building today? We're going to shut it down right there. So the question of the hour is this. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Jesus Christ could come at any moment. He could come before I finish the next word. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Maybe there are some of you here today that, like I was, April 10th, 1983, I was far away from God. I didn't know God, didn't know anything about God, and had no understanding whatsoever of all of this end time stuff. So I can understand and identify with where you're at today. But the question is, are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? What I love is that that the invitation has been sent out. Everything has been done for you to attend the wedding. Now all you got to do is accept that invitation and say, yes, Lord, I want to be ready. Say, Pastor, what do I need to do? Simply this, repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. You mean I don't have to do a bunch of stuff and memorize a bunch of stuff and do this, that, and that, and quit that and stop that? No, no, no. Repent. Turn. Turn from where you're going and put your faith in Jesus. It's as simple as that. My Bible tells me that if we confess him with our mouth as Lord, we shall be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I'm going to give an altar call today. Not only for salvation, I'm going to give an altar call for those of us that just need to make a trip to the beauty salon. And here we go. First of all, those of you living far away from God, you would say, Pastor, I need forgiveness. I'm not living right for God, and I need to make sure I'm ready to go. If that's you, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to slip your hand up all over the auditorium. Do it right now. One, two, three. Put it up. God bless you, ma'am. Just hold it up high so I can see. God bless you. Making sure I don't miss anybody today. God bless you, sir, in the front. I see your hand. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Now, I want everybody to stand with me all over the building. Everybody. Now, listen to me. I'm dead serious. I'm going to give an altar call. And there are plenty of us. And I join you in this. There are plenty of us that need to make a trip to an altar today. And we need to just, you know, some of us today are dealing with just the residue of living in this world. Just stuff that attaches itself to us. There's no shame at this altar. There's nothing wrong with coming to the beauty salon. You're the bride. The invitation has come. In fact, Revelation says the spirit and the bride say, come, come. So whatever it is, whatever blemish or spot that you need God to remove from your life today, I'm telling you the spirit of God wants to do a work right here at this altar. Some of you got bitterness in your life. Some of you are dealing with anger. Some of you just got some habits that that are besetting you in your relationship with God. And you, you just need to lay it at this altar. Some of you got church hurt you're dealing with. Just, just come and let God beautify your soul today. 
We have a prayer team that's going to come. And you don't have to pray with them. You can if you want. Or you can just find a place to kneel here at the altar. As our team begins to sing now, you come. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the message today. And before you leave, make sure you go to our YouTube page and subscribe. And check out our website. New Life exists to love God and lead people to live a better story. So whether you're going to continue to listen to us online or come see us in person, we hope to see you again real soon.